If you take a nice ripe peach and put it in a box and shake it, what happens? Right, and the brain is more sensitive, more delicate than a peach. You expect direct blows to the head like these to cause brain injury, but you don't need to be knocked unconscious for a serious brain injury to occur. It's only as people begin to pick up the fabric of life do they begin to see that they have challenges that they never experienced before. And because folks were not told that they may have sustained a brain injury, they don't link the event to their current symptoms. Grew up in a small town called Tofino, and uh, I got a job as a dive tender for, through one of my friends, and uh, I started working on the boat to uh, go diving for gooey ducks. And they called me up to the boat. So I crawled up the water hose and uh, broke the surface. And there was nobody on the deck of the boat at the time. So I took the regulator out of my mouth and called for somebody to grab me and uh, nobody heard me and uh, I lost the circulation in my hands because the suit was too tight on my wrist. So I ended up sinking to the back to the bottom and drowning. I woke up in the Coast Guard boat, coming back to Tofino Hospital. When the brain is deprived from oxygen for four minutes, the brain cells begin to die. After five minutes, permanent brain damage can occur. I spent two weeks in the hospital. But nobody came to talk to me. Just a WCB guy, and he, uh, he said I couldn't dive anymore, and he cut my diving card up. So I lived from day to day pretty well doing what I can do just to get money in my pocket. Without support, um, early intervention, it, it, it becomes more challenging for them. I think of something that I should do, and I'd either procrastinate or I my mind would change. I'd forget what I wanted to do. A short-term memory loss lack of concentration. The family was, you know, they were moving away from me and didn't want to be around me after a while. Basically, when a person has a brain injury, the whole family has a brain injury because the whole system needs to adjust and adapt. So I'd use alcohol to cope with the problems. I drank a lot of it. Addictions um, can be a real problem for people after a brain injury. Their relationships can tend to isolate and fall apart and so they gravitate to a, a different population, a different culture where they can be accepted. We find that about a third of this population are engaging in uh, what would be considered problematic or dangerous substance use levels. Often that self-medicating becomes a way to deal with the pain and they just don't fit in anymore. They feel like they don't fit in. They feel like they don't belong. The relationships are strained. It's changing. They may not be able to go back to work. They may have lost their home. So they're looking for a way to escape the pain. There are all of these unintended consequences of a brain injury that can lead to you know, criminality, can lead to substance abuse, that can lead to homelessness. All of these are the negative pathways that um, Often, that people often go down the road of um, because they haven't gotten the kind of interventions or treatments they need. For survivors of brain injury, they, it's, they, you can't put a bandage around their head. They look okay, people assume they're okay, but because they've had damage to their brain, it's invisible. I hear voices. Well, you think it's real, right? You think people are really talking to you. And they're playing games with your head games and stuff. It would agitate me. I would get angry, not at the voices itself, but as to what they were saying. So. Oftentimes, folks after a brain injury become dysregulated. 
so they're more likely to have temper outbursts or, you know, become very agitated uh, for no apparent reason. The stats of negative outcomes are, are, are not favorable for, for survivors. In the prison system, it's, it's identified that well over 80% of the population has a brain injury. I uh, ended up going to prison for 13 years, all because of what I'd just gone through. I ended up killing my ex-girlfriend, and. That was a woman I was having trouble with. And sadly regret that, but you know. I don't know. I just a lot of trouble in my life. And uh, it's been um, it's been quite an experience. Frontal lobes are like the central processing center of a computer. So all human activity is regulated by the, the frontal lobes. So if there is some damage to that central unit, it's going to affect everything. Anxiety and depression are extremely common problems, occurring in about 60% of uh, people with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. A woman's son died after a brain injury, and he was a, a BMX, you know, jumper, um, and he uh, got a concussion and ended up committing suicide. Large amount of depression in these folks. The end point of depression is suicide, su suicidality, and one of the best predictors of suicidality is a is a traumatic brain injury. The sooner that you engage in in therapeutics the better off the individual is going to be. You have to do the work of healing, and that's on physical, spiritual, um, emotional. There's on many, many layers to that. And, to, and the other thing would be to look at that rehab is not outside your life. It is your life at that point, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be that a continual stream of professionals of OTs and physical therapy and all of that. Everything that you do is rehabilitating your life. I, I think it's essential for individuals to have um, a program that offers both support for the physical injury as well as the mental health and addiction issues that surround brain injury. And also to have it in an environment that looks at the, the caretakers and the uh, family members that are also affected by these injuries. The sooner we can provide early intervention support to survivors, the, the, the better the likelihood for good outcomes. And, and that's often what we advocate for. The biggest part is how do you build those heart-to-heart -heart connections again in the relationship that you had before in the way that you are now. Wherever they need support, it could be physical issues, physical impairments, could be mental impairments. Our role is finding what the strengths are for the survivors, identifying where their weaknesses are or where they, they may need support and we support accordingly. You know, government funding for these uh, um, support programs is, is, is critical. And I think Canada is facing a, a, a nationwide epidemic of individuals that are both incurring brain injuries or have incurred them in the past, and now it's gonna be showing up in this elderly population. So there's a, a real need um, for government support. We either pay now or we pay later. We invest now for survivors support to the family or we have long-term higher costs, greater costs down the road. And if we look at basic cost savings and the value of community supports, the math is very, very clear. In hospital, the average cost is $1,500 per day. Residential care is $260 per day. Supported housing is $80 per day and independent living in the community with support is $3 per day, but a day in federal prison costs $301. So simple economics 
and, and that's why it's important that we have flow through in through this in terms of this continuing care. We're working together to find most importantly best outcomes for survivors and to a point best tax savings for the public. Of the 1.5 million Canadians living with a brain injury, an estimated one-third or 500,000 are struggling with substance abuse and 60% or 900,000 are experiencing mental health issues such as anxiety or depression. We can have far better outcomes if we provide integrated services to address mental health, addiction and brain injury issues together. Following a brain injury, the risk of suicide for an individual increases by 400%. They have a 200% higher chance of addiction. There's a higher chance of job loss and homelessness. In fact, 52% of homeless people have a brain injury. There's a higher chance of incarceration. It's known 80% of prisoners have a brain injury. The individual has a three times greater risk of suffering a second brain injury. With early intervention, no gap in services and ongoing support, there is a better chance of maintaining a strong support network of family and friends. An individual has better odds of finding meaningful activities, including employment and volunteerism. The individual will have an increased sense of belonging and contribution in their community. They are able to support others who are also living with an acquired brain injury. There will be a reduction in costs associated with policing, emergency services, incarceration, and homelessness.